Friday the 25th of April 1997, Burnden Park, home to Bolton Wanderers for the past 102 years, staged a football match for the very last time. This video, hosted by longtime Wanderers supporter Kenneth Wollstoneholm, takes you behind the scenes on a guided tour of this famous old stadium. We relive some of the highs and lows, some of the triumphs and the tragedies, culminating in that never to be forgotten final match against Charlton Athletic. Well, are we all ready? Are we? Well, this is it. This is Burnham Park, the home of Bolton Wanderers, the Trotters, for 102 years. And it's, well, somewhere that has a very special place in my heart, it means a lot to me. Because as you know, I've been all over the world, been into many great stadia, but not one of them has got the same magic that Burnham Park has for me. Because I was almost a local lad, I went to school near here. Bolton Wanderers always been my team. I first came to see a match here when I was four years of age and I've seen many magnificent games of football, many cracking footballers here too. So I couldn't resist the temptation to come here for one last time before the club moves to its wonderful new stadium. And so let's go inside, should we, and relive some of the magic moments of football at Burnham Park. Ah, well, here we are, safely tucked away underneath the Manchester Road stand. And on match day, this is a busy crossroad, right at the heart of everything. Through here, just look, there are the two doors leading out onto the pitch. And through here, spoils of war. It all began in 1874. Originally called Christchurch FC, the name was changed to Bolton Wanderers three years later. Pikes Lane was the club's first home before a move to Burnden Park in 1895. The start of an illustrious 102-year history of a venue that nurtured numerous great teams capable of winning the game's major honours. Burnden Park yielded four teams that lifted the FA Cup. The last occasion being in 1958, when hero and captain Nat Lofthouse got his hands on football's most treasured of trophies. And in 1997, Burnden's last act was to witness the presentation of the First Division Championship. And so once again, the trotters are riding high and um, they're on the move again, so I hope they pack all that silver very carefully. And now, before we move on, um, what about this nickname, the Trotters? I wonder how that ever came into being. Well, there are three schools of thought. One says, um, wanderers, trotters. You know, you wander, you keep moving. Trotters, they keep trotting around. And uh, The club did change homes many times before they finally came from Pikes Lane to Burnham Park. So um, then there's another school of thought that says, well, trotters, that makes you think of pork. Pork meat gives you big, sturdy thighs, you know, to get in with those tackles and get in with those hard shots. And then there's another school of thought that says, well, trotters, pork, pork pies, porkies. And that ties up with the notion that uh, all Boltonians can tell some pretty tall stories. So anyway. Those are the three versions. You can make your own minds up. And while you're doing that, I think we'll move on now and just go and have a look at the players' tunnel. All right? Well, over the years, literally hundreds of players have milled around here, anxiously waiting for the off. Down the years, they've all jogged their way out onto the Burnden Park turf to get that warm and noisy welcome that Bolton saves up for its own.
fans have always been great to me, Pete, since the, since the day I came here, really. Uh, they've been great to me. I think it helped probably when I, when I first came that I struck up a good understanding with Andy Walker quite quickly and the both of us were scoring goals and really it was a sort of, I think it was probably the time where the club started getting a little bit of success. You know, we went to Anfield and won there, we had a good cup run that season, we ended up getting promotion. So I think probably, you know, because we were playing well, the supporters, you know, they probably took to us, you know, myself and Andy were scoring the goals. But ever since then they've been great to me, not just to myself but to my, to my family as well. They've made us really welcome here and they, haven't, they couldn't do enough for us. Well, I remember playing here in uh, 1951, I think it was, or 52. Uh, Newcastle had just won the FA Cup. Uh, and they, they came here, the first home match of, this, of, the, of the season, the August. And there were 51,000 people here. And I think the score was nil apiece and it was a tremendous game and there's a great atmosphere. Jackie Milton and all these people were playing for, uh, for Newcastle in those days. Of course, Lofty were playing for us. And a tremendous, oh, they used to get great atmosphere there. Great, uh, great support for them. Before the match, they used to have requests. And on this occasion, it were my turn. So, in, and today, the request by Lindsay or whoever it were, for JB, they're a popular player and, and the record come on. I'm standing there thinking, let's listen to what the record is and all of a sudden it was a fatty bum bum. <laughs> so there were more there were more giggles amongst players than they were going. Now on the track, there used to be a chat with a basket, oranges. And people in the crowd would put their hands up. You know, and they'd pass the money down. Like they did when anybody fainted. They pick them up and roll them down over the crowd's heads till, till they got to the track. Well, they used to pass this money down and he'd get the money and the chap would have it on. It'd be in the middle of the embankment or whatever and he'd throw it right to the fella, right to the chap. Expert he was. And I never heard of any money going astray or, or, or oranges or anything. But when the Wanderers moved here from Pikes Lane, the teams used to come out from the other side of the pitch. That was known as the Darcy Lever stand. And the whole aspect of the brand new stadium, brand new as it was then, was vastly different to what it is today because football wasn't the only sport to which Burden Park played host way back then. Well, right here where we're walking, a century ago, they ran the World Mile Championship. But the first ever event at Burden Park was the ninth Wanderers annual athletic festival and that was on um, August the 17th 1895 and there were 20,000 people here not just to watch the track and field events but they also had such unusual events as um, oh, a man on stilts, uh, a high diver and believe it or not a donkey riding a bicycle. <laughs> in those days cycling was um, a very popular sport and so popular in fact that they laid a concrete uh, cycling track uh, around here and it was modelled on the one that was made for uh, the King of Italy no less. Here along the Manchester Road stand instead of this all seated stand complete with its disabled access in 1895 there was only a simple uncovered terrace. It held 5,000 and like today it ran the full length of the ground. The main grandstand the Darcy Lever was 80 yards long it could seat 1,600 people and also house the players' and officials' rooms. Permission was granted by the railway company to terrace the embankment below the railway line. At the other end, the Great Lever end, there was only room for a cramped up 2,000. And that didn't change until 1905. By then, the cycle track had been demolished to make way for the large covered Manchester road stand and for more terraces at either end of the ground and that gave the ground the overall shape it kept right up to the mid-1980s. So the ground held 20,000 people when it was first opened and strangely enough with the modern seating and all the uh, uh, modern uh, safety regulations that's just about what it holds today. But in the years in between saw crowds far larger than that squeeze into Burnton Park just to capture the footballing magic. Yes, crowds like the record-breaking 69,912 people who crammed into Burnden Park to see that uh, FA Cup tie against Manchester City 
way back. And you know, among that 69,912 was a 12-year-old lad, and that was me. And I was standing just about here with my brother, who was two years older than me, and four, four pals. And we got here at midday. Uh, so sort of wanted to get a good position. Couldn't get a better position than this right behind the goal. And um, as kickoff time got near, uh, crowds st were allowed to come in onto the track. We, I don't know why, but uh, they were. And we realised we wouldn't be able to see a thing if this happened. You know, because I wasn't this tall. I was about down here at the time. And I thought, this is no good. So I said, I'm going to faint. And I sort of keeled over a bit. And uh, I was grabbed by the people. Folk were wonderful in those days. And I was lifted up into the arms of the St. John's Ambulance Brigade people who came round. My brother said, I'm his brother. So, oh, you come over, son. He was lifted over. And then the other four said, we're with them. So they were lifted over. And as soon as the last one touched ground, I recovered. And we set off. We ran as fast as we could all round the track and got right round to um, the centre line over there. And we lay on the grass right by the... We could have tripped up some of those Manchester City players if we really wanted to. And we watched the game from there. And, well, sadly, Bolton lost four goals to two. And uh, the atmosphere was tremendous. I know it was Milson, I think, who got the first goal and everyone screamed their head off. Then Ray Westwood scored direct from a corner. But, uh, well, it was no good. Manchester City scored four times. And we were knocked out of the cup. But it was still well worthwhile to be lying there and, um, you know, seeing such a wonderful cup tie. But the rafters of that stand must have been um, absolutely shaking. And that was uh, perhaps a little dangerous for one person who had uh, his own private, uh, well, box, you might call it. Well, uh, 1933, that's the day I pinched in. Uh, and that was a record crowd. I said 69,000, didn't I? Probably wrong, just 2,000. But uh, I can't remember it, but I sat on that stand, on the IPA bar, on the stand, and I pinched in. So I still hold both moments. I think it was threatens then, I don't know. Well, it was a dangerous thing climbing over. I mean, if you slipped, you, you dropped a few feet and you could be possibly hurt, but uh, you didn't think of that. You just wanted to watch the whites play. Now, not every game was a sellout. There had to be one or two failures. Like Pi Saturday, now, that was the FA Cup final replay of 1901 between Sheffield United and Tottenham Hotspur. Now, Bolton were very happy to host the event, but there were thoughts put around whether Burnden Park could really cope with it. And then the railway companies decided not to issue any cheap tickets for the visiting fans, and uh, so of the expected 55,000 people, less than half turned up. But there was a, an upside to all this, because the bakeries in Bolton had worked hard baking cakes and things for um, all the visiting fans, and so there were loads of free pies going begging in Bolton that night. This is the earliest footage of Burnden Park. There's a ground prestigiously staged the 1901 FA Cup final replay between Tottenham Hotspur and Sheffield United. It was only the fourth time that the famous trophy had been contested away from London. Long shorts were customary in those days, but it makes you wonder what today's Reebok fashion gurus would make of the goalkeeper's attire. The attendance figure of 20,000 was something of a letdown, as 50,000 spaces had been made available. For the record, Tottenham Hotspur won the game by three goals to one, with the trophy presented to the winning team by FA President Lord Kinnaird. Now, before the Wanderers made Burnham Park their home, uh, 
This was a waste tip, for industrial waste. Before that, a chemical work stood here. So sandwiched between uh, collieries, culverted as well, and bounded by the River Crow, this site next to a chemical works was really uh, no ideal place for building the New Jerusalem. And true enough, right from the very start, the club had a job on its hands to keep its very poor pitch above water. Well, I've, I've seen games uh, abandoned because they were knee-deep in mud. Uh, some of the grounds now, they're perfect. I mean, you never have a, it's very rare that you see anything that the frost because there's under soil eating. But I played them with a foot deep in mud there, and I used to like playing in those games because everybody was at the same speed. You know, there were, everybody could <laughs> trap a ball. I could trap a ball then when it was a foot deep in mud. That's it. I, I were in the fifth floor's band playing corn it. And we played on here, on Burnley Park. And the first half, before the match started, we marched round the field and up the centre. Well, in those days, oh, we got the centre of the field, everything all right. Then the teams came on, and then we'd watch the match, first half. Then the second half, we'd go on again. And it was muddy, dark, wet, semi-dark, no floodlights those days, or we marched around the pitch again, but in those days, the referee left, it was a leather ball, a brown leather ball, he left that in the middle of the pitch, they didn't take it off, and we were marching up, playing under the double eagle, I think, we were playing, and he smart, the man's master at the front, three quarter red sash, he was very smart, slim, so the band master, was, he fell over the ball, and it was muddy, and it was all, all covered in mud and it didn't, it didn't half swear, never was swearing like it. Well, the ball was there, the ball was there, he took a, a kick at it. But he wasn't a footballer. So he kicked it and it went to, down to the embankment end, see, and stayed there, the ball. So the teams came on and the referee, centre of the pitch, no ball. So looking for the ball. Players are helping and all, so looking for this ball. They found, found it eventually, found it eventually. <laughs> and they found it eventually, I don't know who told them, and it was near the penalty area at the Seine, where he'd kicked it. And I think he did the same thing on another occasion, and I think shortly after that we didn't play it again, I think he'd something to do with it. Just two months after the opening, bad drainage caused the game against Small Heath to be postponed. The pitch just disappeared under huge puddles. And then two months later, Preston North End refused to play a second half, again because of flooding. And by the end of that season, uh, a huge hole appeared in the centre of the pitch. And it took a lot of work during the close season to raise it. And various bits of Burnham Park then begin to have that sinking feeling. Even the cycling track produced endless cracks, very dangerous cracks. Now, time has gone by, various colliery workings have produced again that sinking feeling. But whether the trouble has been above ground or below ground, the club has done its best always to try and fight back against it. Down here, all our, before the underground eating, was down here working all night, me and little Joe and Roy, clearing snow off here. You know. Directors used to bring us whiskey onto the pit for to have a drink, keep us warm while we're shifting snow and whatnot. Now, the undersoil heating has been a great help. It was, and since the 1980s, the 14 miles, there's 14 miles of pipe. That has meant that the ground has been serviceable, but been playable with ice and snow. Now, we could have done with it in the season 1962-63, when there was no undersoil heating, when it was so bad then that many of the games couldn't take place at all. At the same time as the uh, undersoil heating was installed, there was a great deal of remedial work done about the level and about the drainage of the pitch. And there was a suggestion that Burnham Park should have an artificial surface. But that was never uh, followed up. Um, decided that natural grass was the best thing. And the skill and the devotion of the ground staff, and this is very, very important, has kept Burnden Park going despite all the problems that have faced them. And um, you know, we ought to be thankful for them for all the hard work they do in the background to the club. In 1957, the skyline of Bolton changed for good. Burnden Park 
install floodlights. You could see the light shining for miles and miles around, but when that famous Burnton Park fog started to roll in uh, over the park, then the lights made things much worse. Now, down there where St. Peter's wave flows today, in the, in the 1960s, that was just an open river. And this uh, meant that the autumn mists and the autumn fogs would come in and cause havoc, not only on match days, but uh, on normal days, because on the tennis courts, um, down there, that was where the players used to train. A game of football tennis is still a popular form of practice. How about this for a unique way of perfecting the art of heading? In a modern era of high-tech training facilities, this basic apparatus at the time was considered highly effective. Now the Burnden Stand Terrace down there had a distinctive odour about it. It was the damp smell of the fog, mixed with cigarette smoke and quite often with the steam from the trains as they applied their way on the railway line over there and uh, all the matches I've ever watched from this stand you know, whenever I think about them I, st I still recall that distinctive cocktail of uh, various smells and um, you know come rain, ice, fog, snow or whatever apart from that freeze up of 1962-63, the very bad one. Bad weather never put paid to football for very long. It took the talk of a war to do that. And even then, football survived. On Monday the 10th of April 1939, that's just two days after his rallying speech to the crowd for the game with Sunderland, Harry Gosling, the Bolton captain, led the whole team into town and together they all signed up to join the Territorial Army. So that those wartime wanderers could always be ready to play whenever they had the chance, back here at Burnham Park, the club broke its own rules by allowing the boots which the club owned to go out to the players so that they'd always be ready. Well, meanwhile, back here at the ground, the long-serving secretary manager, Charles Fowracre, he held the wartime fort. Now, for love and not for money, he endeavoured and largely succeeded in keeping the game going at Bolton Wanderers throughout the war. They just had one short break but he always was gathering a team together. And as the war was coming to the end, he got more unearthed, more new talent. And the last year of the war, the wartime League Cup came to Burnden Park. During the war, both home and abroad, the Wanderers kept their footballing fire alive. And perhaps it's a tribute to their great spirit that uh, whether on the field of play, field of battle, their spirit remained with them and only two of all the players who volunteered failed to come back. Walter Sidebottom was in the Royal Navy and his ship was torpedoed in the Channel and the club captain Harry Goslin who had been such an inspiration to all his men was a lieutenant in the army and he was killed in battle in Italy. It's heavily ironic that with loved ones back home people savouring peace, and once more big crowds thronging the terraces, Burnden Park should suffer a tragic disaster. I can remember the day and I can remember when I was told to be playing Stoke City and I was Neil Franklin who was sent the post and the referee was just quite close to us and the, there was a policeman ran on the field and asked the referee to stop those, stop the game please and there was near the corner flag there was bodies laid down there. I thought they were fainting cases and the policeman just said well you stop the game referee those people are dead and the referee stopped the game we came off and they brought the people the injured and the dead people through in the dressing room to go to the uh, sort of uh, first aid room.
when the match got started, I thought, my God, they're getting packed. They started lifting them over, over the fencing. So uh, I can't stand to the bar. Hmm. Yeah, but well, there's plenty. Of, there was plenty of room at the other end of the uh, what we call the uh, embankment. There's plenty of room over there. I thought, but I didn't know. I didn't realise it till after that we hadn't the staff. We hadn't got the stewards to marshal them about about the sea. They were coming and they stopped there, so it caused a it caused a right crowd there, and they were tight. And we could see it getting tighter, but still didn't bother. But they got alarmed and the police had the match stopped. The referee stopped the match and they had a chat and the uh, players went off. I thought, my God, this is a skin and seas. There must be somebody got hurt there. They had got hurt. They were being trampled on. I can remember laying all the people out on that on that side of the ground, just there. But to like a 14 and a fi or a 15 year old, you didn't really think about them being dead. We thought they were just injured and they were just lying, bringing them down and lying them, you know, lying them out. But that's what I can remember. I can also remember going home. We went home not realising that all these people had died because we had obviously, well we climbed over the railings actually onto this shale track, you know, and got out that way and I can remember going home and people standing at street corners, you know, because we used to walk, I used to, I come from Double and we used to walk from here to Double, you know, always walk to Burnham Park and when we got to the corner of our street, I mean we hadn't run home, we rushed home, we just... <laughs> My mother's there, you know, where have you been? I haven't heard about it. So yeah, we've been like, you know, but you didn't realise that people had got killed and your mother had stood at the corner of the street waiting if you coming home, you know. And all the street was out when we got home, maybe about quarter to ten and somebody shouted. They're here, Annie, Harry and Florence. She clung to us, she went, Mam, could stop when we were asking you say. We should have gone home really. But there were no telephones. Well we hadn't a telephone. But we should have really have gone home and let her know we were all right. Now, me and my friend, he always left it to me to where we were going. Nice person, older than me. So he said there'd be a big crowd at... Uh, Bolton this afternoon. I said, We're not going. I said, Well, good match. Bolton versus Stoke. I said, Yeah, no. I said, Well, where are we going? I said, We're going to watch an Ackington Stanley play Stockport. He said, What's made you change your mind? I said, I'll, You not believe me, I know when I tell you. I said, I sat up in bed and saw the match. He said, what? I said, I saw them out. I said, they've had a premonition. And I'm not a believer in them. But I said, this was so real till I'm not going. He said, uh, well, what, what's happened? I said, I've seen a tragedy. A lot of people killed on a football field. An inquiry was held in the wake of that 1946 match and it was held that um, the crowd had inflicted the disaster upon themselves. And I suppose that's strictly true. But it was noticeable that when the game resumed, and that was a ploy to prevent any further panic, um, a thousand or so people from the crowd were suddenly found seats in the Burnden stand. Now, I can't help wondering what would have happened that afternoon if Bolton Wanderers hadn't been deprived of all that space for spectators. Well, Sam, on that note, I think we ought to break for a coffee, don't you? Good.
wanderers had long known that they could pull huge crowds if the occasion was right. There were many other games in pre-war years that had filled Burnden Park to the seams, but it was that famous White Horse Cup final in 1923 that had been a clear indication of what could happen. Bolton Wanderers and West Ham United had the distinction of being the first ever Wembley FA Cup finalists. The official capacity was set for 120,000, but even in the 20s, with the competition still in its relative infancy, the romance and magic of the FA Cup was still very much to the fore. His Royal Highness, King George V, was amazed to see the incredible turnout. Eventually a gangway was forced, enabling the players to make their way from the dressing rooms to the field of play. It took a number of police horses, including the famous White One, to usher the spectators beyond the touchline. Order was still being restored as the captains completed the pre-match preliminaries. With the game underway, the Bolton players set about their task. Three minutes into the game, David Jack became the first player to score in a Wembley FA Cup final, handing Bolton the lead. and double their advantage with this goal from John Smith. Spectators were keen to get a good view of the presentation as Bolton's captain Joe Smith became the first man to lead a team up the famous Wembley Stairs to get his hands on one of football's most sought after prizes. In 1953, Lowry's famous work, Going to a Match, was modelled on Burnham Park. It was coronation year, and the Wanderers themselves had their own ideas of crowning glory as they went south to Wembley to play in the FA Cup final. It was a legendary final against Blackpool. And although Lofthouse put the Wanderers in the lead in the second minute, the combined talents of Matthews and Mortensen was just too much for the Wanderers and denied them victory. About 100,000 were lucky enough to be at Wembley Stadium for the Cup Final. All of them, of course, had their own ideas about the probable result, but one thing was quite certain, the Cup was bound to go to Lancashire. In their dressing room, Bolton, prepared for battle, determined to triumph under the leadership of Billy Moyer. The crowd hadn't long to wait now before the teams came out. Bolton Wanderers in white shirts and dark shorts. The arrival of the Queen with the Duke of Edinburgh was the occasion for renewed cheering by spectators. 
And presently the Duke went onto the field and the teams were presented. set in motion by Blackpool centre-forward Mortensen. The first sensation of a sensational cup final came in the first minute. Bolton attacking, the ball comes into centre-forward Lofthouse, who shoots from long range and beats far. One up to Bolton. A nasty shock for Blackpool, but Stan Matthews was already showing first-class form, and as everyone knows, the maestro can be a match winner. An injury to Bolton's left half, Bell, who now limped along an outside left, was a severe handicap, but Bolton got pretty close to scoring again within a few minutes. Football fans feel things keenly, don't they? Then the equaliser by Mortensen, who beat Hassel and Hansen. Who would be a goalie at a moment like this? Five minutes later, Bolton regained the lead through their skipper, Moyer. So the Royal Spectators and the great Wembley throng saw Bolton kick off in the second half with a goal in hand. Ten minutes later, a centre from right winger Holden was headed through by Eric Bell in spite of his injury. 3-1 to Bolton. I can remember winning 3-1 and 17 minutes to go. And I'll not say we were very complacent, but I thought we were going to win. I thought we were going to win. And still putting the same effort and endeavour into the game. But at 3-1 and 17 minutes to go, I had a bite my life on it, but unfortunately Mr Matthews had different ideas and uh, Mr Mortensen and Stan got the hat-trick at Wembley. Minor injuries were fairly frequent, a collision between Garrett and Lofthouse was a case in point, but they were soon in action again. Blackpool's second goal followed a centre from Matthews, which Hansen failed to clear. Mortensen did the rest, Bolton three, Blackpool two, and still time for more sensation. Now Mortensen takes a free kick and scores. Surely it must be a draw, but no, with a minute to go came Blackpool's fourth, made by Matthews, and smashed in by Perry. Blackpool had done it. Congratulations came thick and fast as the players left the field of battle after one of the most dramatic cup finals on record. It wasn't hard to come to terms because there were two Lancashire clubs and that was the only consolation. The cup was coming back to Lancashire. Uh, but uh, I think the people saw a really, truly exciting game. They saw a goal in the first two or three minutes, and then they saw a goal in the dying minutes. So what more could you have? And they saw seven goals, 4-3, so it was some game. Just the evening before that 1953 final, Matt Lofthouse, who'd scored in every round of the Cup that season, was voted the Footballer of the Year. He was a real hot property without any doubt at all. And he's also dubbed the Lion of Vienna because of the great performance he put for England in Vienna the year before. And he proved himself at Wembley a true leader of Bolton's all-international forward line. This is the incident that prompted the legend. The 25th of May 1952 saw an international between Austria and England played in the Austrian capital Vienna. With time ticking away, Matt Lofthouse bravely risked injury from the onrushing goalkeeper to snatch the winning goal. Oh, I think it's a terrific honour and it's not only for me, it's for the rest of the England team what played in uh, Austria in Vienna. Uh, I was just lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time and score two goals. And, uh, <laughs> they just tagged me that name and... I'm glad they did, mind you, don't get me wrong, but I think it was a, a team affair, that. We won 3-2, and that's all that mattered.
although FA Cup glory had eluded them just five years ago, in 1958, it was Bolton Wanderers' turn. One of the most memorable, obviously, obviously was the, um, the sixth round of the FA Cup when we, um, the year we got to the final, when we, we won the Cup in 58. We played uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers here. Wolves in the dark neckbands have plenty at stake when they kick off against the other Wanderers, Bolton, before Wolves are top of the league and dreaming of that elusive double. Amongst the many tussles between Billy and Nat in that era, a quarter file in for the 56,000 at Bolton in 1958. Champions elect Wolves were beaten 2 1. Rumour has it that Bill, Bill Ridden, our, our manager, God rest his soul, um, there's, say somebody is, saw him walking up Manchester Road there about a quarter of an hour to go, he couldn't bear to watch it. <laughs> but it was a tremendous atmosphere that was 60,000 people there and hanging on for deciding whether we were going to the cup semi-final or whatever and we managed to hang on and uh, of course we got through and um, eventually won the cup. After a hard battle against Wolves they qualified to go to Wembley for the FA Cup final against the old friends and rivals Manchester United. Now this final was tinged with sadness for a lot of people because of the Munich air disaster but nothing could stop Nat Lothouse storming through the game in front of 100,000 spectators and scoring both goals that won Bolton Wanderers the FA Cup. 100,000 or so were there and they fairly cheered Matt Busby who had recovered sufficiently to be present as his Manchester United men came out beside their white-shirted opponents Bolton Wanderers. The Queen had not got over her cold but Prince Philip was there to meet the teams, Bolton first. Now United are presented to His Royal Highness. Then Bobby Charlton sets the ball rolling and the match of the season is underway. Bolton are soon driving down the left wing. They force a corner. Less than three minutes have passed when Brian Edwards puts in a perfect cross and Nat Lofthouse does the rest. It's a goal! A quick one like that is surely the answer to any cup final team's prayer. But United react at once. They're going very strong. But Bolton's experienced quick tackling defence is keeping them out. It's reported that the Bolton players took tranquilizers. Looked as if she could do with one too. Manchester's forward line attack again, and a slowed down camera shows the brilliance of a Hopkinson save. But nothing shakes this chap. Every spectator at Wembley must now have looked forward to more thrills in the second half. After Bolton had kicked off, United were soon away at full speed in search of the equaliser. And after eight minutes play, a fizzer from Charlton comes back off the post into Hopkinson's arms. A narrow shave for Bolton. But two minutes later, they were attacking. Then a hard shot from Stevens is held by Greg, and Lofthouse puts him and the ball into the net. I didn't think of anything really, honestly. I just charged the ball and Harry and me finished up in the back of the net. And I looked round and the referee was pointing the other way. That was to the centre spot. And I didn't argue with the referee. I just ran back and that was it. Harry Gregg is down and the players gather round while the trainer works on him. Happily, he's not badly hurt. People think, they think Harry Gregg and me are still enemies. I got Harry Gregg cup final tickets last year. We're still friends, we still have been, always have been and always will be. So there's no animosity between Harry and me, none at all. No, we're still good friends, always have been, because he just said I'd have done the same to you, Lofty. After a few minutes, the match gets going again, with Bolton now two up. Greg's evidently all right and being kept pretty busy, too. Well, that's almost the end of the story, for although there was plenty of good football, there was no more scoring. Bolton Wanderers had certainly earned congratulations for their fourth Wembley win.
while Manchester United deserve the highest praise for reaching Wembley against all odds. As for Nat Lofthouse, he'd led his men to victory, he'd scored the goals, and now he received the cup from Prince Philip. Yes, Nat's dreams had certainly come true. Well, it's nice, isn't it? It's nice just getting there, whether you win or lose. But it's nice when you get there and you win. And it's nice for the people of Bolton who supported you all through the football season. Bolton's dressing room and Matt Busby, like the sportsman he is, comes to offer his congratulations. For the Wanderers, the end of the story is champagne. Well shaken before taken, but my word, it's good medicine. It's every footballer's dream to... Uh to play for, your, for your, your club at Wembley in the cup final. And if you can win it, that's the icing on the cake. And that is tremendous. It's a tremendous feeling. Well, many changes have been uh, over overseen in this room, the director's lounge. Now, in the 1970s, commercial pressures and the need to keep the finances buoyant caused, called for some very tricky footwork. Now, this was nothing new to the Trotters because um, they suddenly realised that they could um, steal a march on the other clubs and create some more football history. And this they did by selling um, team sheets instead of tickets. And th that beat all the legal objections. And on the 6th of January 1974, they played Stoke City. And Burnham Park saw first ever league match played on a Sunday. I don't think you're thinking it at the time, but as time's gone on and you see it mentioned um, about being the first pro match and scoring an hat trick on that day, then you know, good for good for me for history. But on the day, it was it was a good fun. But it was the electric strike, so they played on a Sunday and outside ground you got. People, Bible bashers, we, you know, thou shalt not play on a Sunday, and so there was a bit of fun before the game. Now, throughout its history, when money's been tight, it often has been for the Wanderers, but the Wanderers have always turned up trumps. In fact, the very move here to Burnham Park um, was bankrolled by um, having a football team, an ambitious football team, and the issue was. 4,000 shares of one pound each. And anybody who bought two dozen or more was given a free seat in the stand for life. Now, before you rush home and start looking in the attic for any spare share certificates, I can tell you that um, long ago that privilege was withdrawn. And then, uh, after that came the drop into the second division and this created more financial problems for the Wanderers. But in 1970, the club was um, re almost reformed by the issue of not uh, 4,000, but 40,000 new shares, and with rather fewer perks for the shareholder. By the late 1970s, the cost of players was rising, and it be there was a pressing need then to bolster up the young-grown, homegrown youth talent with some uh, rather more experienced and uh, talented, uh, bought-in players. And by the late 80s, sadly, Bolton Wanderers' coppers were just about dry. They were losing £10,000 a week, the playing results weren't good, and they were facing financial ruin. And they had to make a great decision. They had to sell the, some land to the Normid store, which is here today, and they also had to think up another great idea, a life-saving idea, which they sensibly called Lifeline. Now, what was Lifeline? Well, the supporters paid two pounds a week for the chance of winning a 2,000 pound jackpot. And it appealed to the supporters, thousands of whom joined in, and uh, it made a great difference to the Bolton Wonders finances. But they also uh, got another source of income because they franchised the idea to many other clubs and therefore got an extra income. Since the mid-1980s, Bolton Wanderers are back in the medals. Freight Rover Trophy runners-up, winners of the Sherpa Van Trophy, 
runners-up in the Coca-Cola Cup, and now the runaway champions of the nationwide first division. But you can spend all the money you like. There is only one thing that brings success. When all is, all is said and done, that's the goal. Down the years, there have been hundreds of goals, of course. Many have been relived and relished. Others have been turned into legends, like Joe Smith's double hat-trick against Stoke City in 1916. And then in 1983, when Jim McDonough, the goalkeeper, gave that great punt down the park, and it dropped straight into the Burnley net for a goal. But I think when you speak to the Bolton fans, and if you said to them, there is only one goal you can choose, which one would it be? Well, I know which one I'd choose. Allardyce's throw. Was header Gowling under it. Worthington's um, Worthington now from Gowling's header and Worthington. And what a beautiful Worthington goal! Which it was just a, an instinctive uh, reaction to a situation that evolved on uh, in, in a in a in a match situation, and uh, um, you know we'd done it enough times in training in in uh, in five sides and that type of thing defenders coming in and flicking it over their heads and you know either a shot on goal or passing it to another player and that but uh, this all just happened uh, in a in a match situation and uh, you know the the thing that I was moving away from the goal whilst I was juggling the ball instinctively I knew in my mind that the space was in behind the defenders so it was just a natural thing for to me to flick the ball over my head and, and Terry Butcher's head and, and all the Ipswich defenders as they were coming out and, uh, and, and try and catch it on the volley as it came down and everything worked out beautifully and uh, uh, you know I mean it's it just one of those goals that uh, you know I will be remembered for and for me. Uh, so I was ball ball behind the goal um, I think it came in from a corner and it got cleared and it, uh, someone knocked it back into Frank and he kept it up uh, two or three times on his knee and his foot. He just knocked it over his head, spun, and uh, just fell into the bottom corner and he, he ran, away, ran away to the, the Burnden Terrace. And, uh, you know, he was mobbed by all the rest of the Bolton fans. Well, this is the uh, shower room of the home dressing room. And um, from here, there is always a bell, so players are never late getting out onto the pitch. But one or two of them um, get back here rather earlier than they should have done. And it was in January 1902 when John Sutcliffe, the Bolton Wanderers goalkeeper, he objected to a Sheffield Wednesday goal and he was the first Bolton player sent off to have an early bath here in this um, shower and um, bathroom. And um, there are not many Bolton players have been sent off, but you know, quite a few at the time, and some of them had strange reasons for being sent off the field. I've been suspended once or twice, but I'm well, I'm well booked. And there's one occasion when a referee just caught me out corner of his eye, and I just clipped a block around right ankles, and he um, he come across to boot me. And I'll not say his name because he was doing a bit of courting with a local woman, and um, we knew about it. So I were up for suspension if I got four points. I just had a word in his ear and went ticket, come back from FA, we're down to one point, so a bit of blackmail and suiting us both. There are injuries too which bring players back here rather sooner than they should do. There was one strange one on Christmas Day 1920 when the great Joe Smith, the Bolton captain, headed the ball out there on the pitch, it was a bit of a heavy pitch, and knocked himself unconscious. You see, uh, the old-fashioned leather casey was a bit hard to head when and a bit dangerous to head 
uh, when it, because it absorbed all the water and was probably twice its normal weight uh, soon into the game and that's what happened to Joe Smith and he was carried off unconscious into the dressing room. Right, well this, this is the visitor's dressing room. Not quite so nice is it? But it's um, seen quite its fair share of dramas. For instance there was this uh, famous unforgettable match against Fulham and it wasn't just the fact that they got the least comfortable dressing room that Fulham had to feel very sore about on that day because they were leading two goals to one when 90 minutes was up. But incredibly the referee played on and on and on until suddenly Bolton equalised. That was six minutes into injury time. Well there was a bit of an uproar as you can imagine and Bobby Moore of all people was sent off for dissent and uh, within a minute his teammates followed him and they came into the dressing room, shut the door and he took the referee, two linesmen, a couple of policemen, all hammering on the door outside, finally persuaded Fulham to come out, finish the match and play extra time. And the game ended 2 all. And Fulham went away, not very happy bunnies I can tell you. <coughs> Well, when the Trotters kicked off here at Burnham Park in 1895, I wonder whether they ever expected the great triumphs that were to come in the 20s, the 50s, the 70s, and now the 90s. The football was gripping, including five FA Cup finals and now the triumphant return to, to the Premiership. And throughout it all, the support has been strong and it's been loyal. So. I wonder what the secret of all that success has been. I wonder whether it's uh, this little uh, potion that Matt Lofthouse and um, his chums have been drinking before every match in the old days and today. Oh well. Ooh. What do you think? Um, uh, I dread to think. Oh, I wonder what it is. Anyway, here we go. Oh, I can tell you now. It's two dozen eggs and two bottles of sherry. <laughs> They'd never get away with that today. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. And so to that final emotional last day at Burnham Park. A day that was to see a match of high drama, with fortune swinging first one way and then another. A day that was to see the First Division Championship presentation as the last ever act on Burnton Park. And a day that was to see many of Bolton's former players making an emotional last appearance on the Burnton Park turf. The day began, however, in pouring rain, with many of the Burnton Park staff with mixed emotions. But uh, yes, it'll be, uh, like everybody else, it'll be a very sad night um, when we finally close the doors, but it has to be done, I think. I'll miss it. I'll miss it. Can't believe it. I mean, I've not slept for four nights now. Can't believe it's closing down.
at the moment they're quite calm. <laughs> I don't know how they'll be come at 10 o'clock this evening. I would imagine there'll be a tear or two shed because this is the emotional home of Old Wanderers and it's a very historic evening. Uh, I hope we can all enjoy it, but at the end of the day, it, it is you know, a sad day. When you look back and see and heard of the various people that have trod this, this pitch, uh, for it suddenly to end, um, even though you're going on to better things and we're well aware of that, your heart is here with Burnham Park, it's been your life for so many years and it's, it, it, it's quite emotional without doubt. Very, very sad. I've got a lot of, lot of anchors with me because I know, not just me, a lot of Bolton fans, the tears will fall to me. Very, very sad occasion. But we have to look forward to the future. New stadium, in the Premiership, it's all going our way, isn't it? So one of my first purposes tonight will be get out there, have a quiet word, just ease them into it, hope then that they'll just get on with the game, relax, put a good game on for the spectators, because it's important, I think, when you've got a big crowd in, that everything goes OK and that we have a, a trouble-free night. We're leaving Burnham Park after some terrific years, some terrific Saturday afternoons, terrific nights, some highs, some lows. I feel for the supporters today, I really do. I feel one of them. It's going to be sad leaving this place, but one of also feelings of anticipation, going to the new ground, going back into the Premiership, with the club probably as well fixed as it's ever been in its history since, eight, since it was formed in 1874.
know what that is? No. It's a half crown. Uh, which is not in circulation now, but my grandmother gave me that when I first started refereeing. Yeah. Now it's been with me every single game that I've, uh, I've refereed. Okay. Lovely. Okay, chaps. Well, all the best, my son. Andy, let's do the business. Okay, all the best, fellas. Let's get the show on the road. So to the final action, as the Bolton players were eager to bid farewell to their working home with the right result. Well, the one thing that will go to the new stadium with Bolton is the centre spot because it's going to be ceremonially dug up after and taken to the new place so that will be the link between the old and the new and talking of new Charlton wearing their new second strip tonight as they kick off in this very special occasion it's league game number 1873 at Burnham Park and Bolton have won the majority of the previous ones will it be league victory number 1032 for them There's Michael Janssen, and Thompson's made another of those good runs of his. Just unable to bring that one under control. I don't think he realised how much space he had, he could have let that drop. He was right in behind the Charlton defence again. It's becoming quite a productive position for him, but uh, Thompson misses out there. And there's the possibility of a real break on here, it's Kinsella! It's a screamer of a goal! It really takes the edge of the Bolton party because it's Charlton who take the lead. of achieving parity rapidly disappearing and they have disappeared for the first period anyway well 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 this wasn't the script the lion the mascot here has been doing his best to 
whip up the enthusiasm of the troops. He really has rallied the crowd at half time, and the game kicks off for the second period with the atmosphere given new vibrancy. Something to cling on to. Sellers takes the free kick, McGinley was going for it. Clear to Alan Thompson! And what a cracking start to the second half! That's more like it. Bolton back in the game. Sellers cross, tag it! Goal! It may have started badly, but Bolton have turned it around. And could this be the goal that lets them leave Brandon Park celebrating? McKinley waiting in the box. Here's Scott Sellers. Sellers going through. He's gone down. It's a penalty.
Back again on the morning, the morning after the night before. The party's over, but um, I just couldn't resist coming back to just say a few last words, words which you might have heard before. They think it's all over. Ah, no, not a chance. <laughs> 